Okay. Okay, guys, uh, so we are uh, finishing chapter four, which means after this lecture, you're eligible to receive your next exam, right? I just want to just uh, make sure that uh, the way it looks is, is kind of scary enough, especially in the extra credit questions. So we need to learn um, a few things about um, inequalities, Chebyshev inequality, and then uh, later on laws of large number. And let's see if we can distinguish between them. So first we will need to learn Markov's inequality. And it says the following, if X is a non-negative random variable, you see X is bigger than or equal to zero, uh, then for any alpha, the probability that X is bigger than or equal to alpha is less than or equal to the expected value of X divided by alpha. So it relates probabilities with estimations um, relating to expected value. You understand? I can esti If I know the expected value, I will be able to estimate the probability. That's the point here, okay? So here is a simple proof of it, right? So alpha is bigger than zero. The random variable only takes non-negative values. So I can, I can calculate what's alpha times the probability that X is bigger than or equal to alpha. You with me? And that will be alpha times the summation of all the XK that are bigger than alpha because X is bigger than alpha. The result has to be an outcome that's bigger than this number. And I add up the sum, yes? And then what I see is this, look at it. Xk is bigger than alpha. So this summation that I have on my left is less than or equal to the summation Xk bigger than or equal to alpha Xk times probability of Xk. And look at what I have on the side. It looks like it's part of the expected value sum. But I'm not adding over all probabilities times the value. I'm only adding uh, the probabilities times the value for which the value is bigger than alpha. So because that's where I use the fact that the random variable is non-negative, is that now I can introduce more terms and I'm only growing the sum. I'm only making it bigger. Are you with me? Do you see how uh, this uh, is similar to that? Uh, professor, how do we go from uh, alpha on the outside to xk on the inside again? Uh, because look at it, do you see that, that uh, when we are saying probability that x is bigger than or equal to alpha, that means I'm adding the probabilities of all xk that are bigger than alpha, yes? So if I, or if I instead, so if I multiply, so here I have alpha multiplied by all those probabilities. If I replace alpha individually by the xk, I'm only making the sum bigger because xk is bigger than alpha, do you see? So this was an alpha and now it is an xk. Are you with me guys? Thank you, Shotaro, that you asked. Guys, I need to be so quickly confirm. Yes, you are with me. I mean, don't uh, delay with that. Are you with me? This alpha was replaced yes. by xk. I'm only measuring inequality. So it's not, it's not equal, it's just changing. Good. And uh, then this full summation I replace by the unrestricted summation. With some of those, those xk can now be smaller than alpha, but I'm just adding more terms because xk's are all positive. That's why I assume that x is bigger than zero. Are you with me? So I got this estimate that alpha times the probability that x is bigger than or equal to alpha is less than or equal to the expected value of this random variable. And from there, I just divide by alpha on both sides and I have this estimate that expected value over alpha is a number always bigger than the probability. Good, so I have some uh, estimate and you will see in a moment when that's gonna be useful. Good. So here we are going to first talk about Chebyshev's inequality. If X is a random variable with mean mu, and variance sigma squared, then for any value k bigger than zero, the probability that the distance between x and mu is bigger than or equal to k is always less than the variance divided by the number k squared, okay? Sigma squared over k squared, that's an important inequality. Let's see how that's supposed to work, ready? So I simply, Observe that absolute value of x minus mu is a positive, uh, is a, is a non-negative random variable, yes? And the fact that it's bigger than or equal to k, 
I can relate it to variance by squaring it. The reason I, I use variance is that if, I, if this inequality is true, it's, this inequality is the same as the inequality squared. You see from this step to that step, right? It's the same thing. X minus mu in absolute value is bigger than or equal to K, if and only if the square of each number is uh, keeping this inequality. Because both K and whatever number here is positive, right? K is bigger than zero. You see, and square function is increasing for positive numbers. Do you understand that this line and that line are the same? Now, what is this? This is now, um, this is variance. This is just variance of uh, X minus mu squared is the variance and variance bigger than K squared according to Chebyshev's inequality, it's the, it's the expected value of this random variable divided by k squared, variance divided by k squared. Are you with me? You understand now I use the Chebyshev inequality because it's squared, it's a, it's a non-negative random variable. It, so instead of this x in, min, uh, in Markov's inequality, I use uh, x minus mu squared. And so calculating the expected value of x minus mu squared and dividing by this number, as is required in here, you see? whatever positive random variable, take the expected value of it and divide by this uh, value, by the alpha. The alpha here is k squared. So it's variance divided by k squared or sigma squared divided by k squared. Oh my God, today I'm blessed. I have 20 students. I haven't seen 20 students in a while. And last Wednesday, Naomi, I only saw six students. Apparently there is such a thing as uh, Wednesdays not being Wednesdays. All right, but for us, every Wednesday is a Wednesday, every Tuesday is a Wednesday, every day is a Wednesday, okay? Even the weekends, I'm sure. I do plan to consider, you see, if you were not resistant, I would actually encroach on your weekends. We will do probability on the weekends. Probability in the morning, probability in the evening, at night and after lunch. That's how you get big and strong. Good? So here is a question. Okay, we understood uh, how this works. You see how sigma squared over k squared was used. So that gives us estimates, you understand? I can uh, calculate, uh, I can estimate uh, uh, using Chebyshev's inequality, I can, make, I can make estimates of certain probabilities. Okay, maybe very bad estimates, but uh, they are useful, especially when we prove the law of large numbers, right? So this, they work, they're ubiquitous. They, you might have better estimates, but those estimates are ubiquitous to all random variables. Suppose that it is known that a bakery produces X number of cakes per day, where X is a random variable with mean 50, okay? So can you imagine that guys, right? So um, we have a bakery and uh, based on their experience that you kind of observed the bakery over many years, you see that uh, the average number of um, cakes that were produced per day is 50. So sometimes more, sometimes less, but on average, you find that if you average, let's say the days of the year, you see 50 cakes per day. Good. So then the first question is question A. Let's see if you can calculate it and do it fast. What can be said about the probability that today over 75 cakes will be produced? I know nothing about this random variable. I haven't measured any probabilities. All I have is tables. Can you imagine I run this, maybe the bakery exists for 50 years. I don't know how long it exists or 70 years or just several years. And I have uh, averages. I, I have tables containing day one, here is how many cakes, day two, how many cakes. And, and this 50 is what I averaged. Expected value, I mean, is, is what I averaged over the table. I see that I produce 50 cakes per day. The question is, what's the, what can you say about the probability that um, over 75 cakes will be produced? Okay, thank you, Alejandro. All right, so let's, let's quickly do it together. Yes, guys? Uh, it's very simple. So here is what happens here. 
we know that x, the number of cakes that I produce, it's a non-negative random variable, right? I'm, I haven't heard of producing negatively many cakes, right? And nobody vomits cakes out or something, right? So um, we have that, we want to know that what's the probability that x is bigger than 75. I know nothing about uh, x except the average, which is 50, right? So what, what, what's the name of the Markov's inequality? By Markov's inequality, I know that this probability is less than uh, or equal to the expected value, the average that I calculated divided by this number, by what X is supposed to be bigger than, that's the alpha. You see that? Let me just emphasize it. So it's a probability that X is bigger than alpha. Here is that alpha. Is less than or equal to expected value of X divided by alpha. So I divide by 75 based on that result. Make sure you can verify uh, this inequality. It's like a simple observation. Here is, here is why I divide by 75. Now, I know that the average is, the average is 50. So 50 over 75 or two thirds, if you simplify it. Yes? Two thirds. Now, here is the next task. Can you do that one? If the, uh, so if the variance is known, so you, you see that the variance is known to equal 25. What can be said about the probability that today's production will be between 40 and 60 cakes? Okay, Naomi, let's, uh, okay, guys, if you're working, I guess I have to move on. We have less time than I imagine. I somehow imagine we work on New Year's, but a uh, semester is over before it. Like somebody asks me, what am I doing for Christmas? I'm assuming we're celebrating it together. No? You smiled, uh, smile at me like the answer is no, but the answer should be yes. So here is what happens here. Uh, 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 so be careful here. I hope I haven't made a mistake, which I might have. Uh, so I remember that somewhere I, I, I uh, wrote something incorrectly. So we have X is between 40 and 60. So when I subtract uh, 50, X minus 50, I'm, I'm constructing the variance here. X minus 50 is uh, in absolute value less than 10. Do you see X minus 50 is between minus 10 and 10. So X minus 50 is less than 10. And here, I think Naomi said one quarter. I think it's, it's incorrect. I think, uh, what, should, what should I want? I want, the pro I, I want one minus the probability that X minus 50 is bigger than the number, right? Because this is uh, the direction of the inequality. So I think I made myself a mistake here. And uh, possibly Naomi did the same mistake, right? So I want this. I'm going to ask for uh, this is one minus the probability that absolute value of X minus 50 is bigger than or equal to 10. Yes? 
one minus. And so when I do, uh, so, and, and what do I know? And what, what I know about this thing is that, uh, is that should I write the, the probability uh, of absolute value of X minus 50 uh, bigger than or equal to 10. It's, uh, it's, le it's less than or equal. It's less than or equal to uh, 25, which is the variance divided by 10 squared, yes? Or one quarter, yes? Am I right, Nomi, right? Am I right, everybody? Because I think one quarter here is the uh, is mistake. Right? The one I wrote here is a like, um, similar thing. So one quarter, so, uh, so one minus it, uh, is going to be the inequality is in, in reverse direction. It's bigger than or equal. So the probability that I will make this amount is bigger than or equal to uh, one minus one quarter, yes, or uh, three quarters. So the probability that's the number of cakes I'll make is uh, uh, is between three quarters and one. You understand? So I think I made a small mistake here. Uh, so this calculation in B is like what know me if I, I believe you're all the same thing uh, and that's a, that's a, that's wrong yeah good wonderful marvelous so now weak law of large numbers so pay attention guys it, it is this is where this those ideas are useful so let x1 x2 and onwards be a sequence of independent and identically distributed random variables each having the same variance or the same mean, not variance, the same mean, okay? Then this is basically uh, trying to, weak law of large numbers is, is a one attempt to justify that uh, running uh, sequence, remember? Running sequence that we have here. We, you can define probability axiomatically uh, without understanding what probability is. And then you, you from that axiomatic approach, you can um, use it to conclude that if it holds, then uh, uh, the average, remember that like we did with the toin, coin tosses, the average will in fact tend to the, the average of the experiment will tend to the actual average uh, of the, the to, to the actual expected value to be precise. You understand? What is it saying? This is saying that uh, if I take the, uh, if I run the experiments numerous times, the average of my experiments will become very close with, with the probability it will become very close to the theoretical average is going to be very high. And this is expressing it as a limit. Okay. In other words, the probability that you will find that the average is deviating significantly from the, uh, from the theoretical average will be very low probability. That's what the law um, of the weak law of large numbers is saying. Okay. Let's consider the proof. Are we ready for the proof? Take a deep breath. This one is not too hard, but uh, um, the next one will be a bit harder. And what's the difference between strong and weak law of large numbers? That's hard. So here is what we have. The expected value of, this, of the summation, x1, it's, the, it's, the, it's one over n, the sum of the expected uh, values. And altogether we get that the expected value of the average for each n is just mu. Are you with me? You, you always get that the average for all of them, the theoretical average is mu. Now, what is the variance? The variance, uh, because they're independent, the variance is the sum of the variances. Remember that? We did it before. Uh, so that would be one over n squared and the variance of each individual is uh, sigma squared. We have one over n squared times n sigma squared, which is sigma squared over n. The variance is, is tending to zero. With, with large n, it's gonna be small, okay? So now, what's the probability that, uh, that the average will be different from the theoretical average. In other words, what's the probability uh, as n is large that uh, it will be bigger than epsilon, okay? And, and by, and by uh, Chebyshev's inequality, it will be the, remember we calculated the variance of this entire thing, right? This minus mu is, uh, is simply the variance of this, uh, of this random variable, right? This, the summation minus mu squared will be the variance, okay? So then by Chebyshev's inequality, it will be the variance is sigma squared over n divided by this number squared, that's by Chebyshev's inequality. Do you get it? How you get it? And, uh, and of course, if n is large, this number will be very small. The number goes to zero. 
So what this is saying is something a bit weird. It says that uh, the probability, if you, if you conduct numerous experiments, if n is large enough, we can kind of estimate how large should n be in a moment. And then the probability of observing a discrepancy, uh, or significant discrepancy, this is the significance, will be very low. Here is an experiment, okay? Here is uh, a, a, some example. How many times must we toss a fair coin in order to ensure that uh, the sample average of the number of tails is within uh, uh, 0 0.1 of one half, 99% of the time the experiment is performed. You understand what I'm saying, right? So imagine that I, I want to know how many times should the fair coin be tossed so that uh, uh, the deviation from the average is going to be no more than uh, 0 0.1 units. Okay, it makes sense 0 0.1, in other words, one half is zero. So the average that I'm getting is between 0 0.4 and uh, 0 0.6, okay? So I want, uh, I want my average to, when I, when I do the experiment, the, the average number of tails to be, um, to be between 0 0.4 and 0 0.6, 99 out of 100 times, okay? I want to kind of uh, see how many tosses do I need to perform based on this experiment. Okay. Do you understand my question, guys? It sounds a bit complicated, but can you grasp it, right? So I'm trying to set up an experiment where uh, I can be 99% certain that when I finish performing this experiment, the average will be a number between 0 0.4 and 0 0.6. Yeah, the actual average uh, is one half. When, I, when enough to, trials are performed, but I, but the experimental average will have an error, so not be exactly one half. So here is what I do. And again, uh, this is uh, this might not be a strict inequality. You might be able to perform fewer trials. This is just uh, working for all random variables. It's general, which means it might not be very specific for this coin experiment. Maybe you can perform fewer and be and ensure that it's true, right? So here is what happens. So x k is one if k of toss is tail and zero other way. So tails means success here. So we know that the theoretical average is one half. We calculated it easily. And we know that the variance of the k of toss is going to be one quarter. Do you agree? It's um, simply one half minus one half squared, which is one quarter. Are you with me? So here is what I uh, want to observe, right? I want uh, the difference, the, the actual, uh, the sample average minus theoretical average, I want the probability that it's bigger than one over 10, that the difference between them is bigger than one over 10 to be less than, uh, uh, it's gonna be less than by Chebyshev's inequality, less than uh, one quarter, which is uh, the variance of one of those random variables divided by this number squared, one over 10 squared and, and the N comes from the number of uh, trials that we perform. It's one quarter divided by N. That would be the var variance is, is basically the variance of the average here will be the individual variance divided by number of trials. You understand? That's where the N comes. So it's one quarter over N. So altogether, what do I have here? So uh, then I can write this as, and then just rearranging terms, it's really the same as 25 over N. You agree? One quarter divided by one over 100, it's like 100 divided by four, which is 25 over n. And I want this probability to be less than 100. All right, 25 over n less than 100, which means that n should be more than 2,500. Based on this, I'm not claiming that for this experiment, the convergence might be more rapid. But if I set n to be that large, I can be assured based on this theorem that uh, if, I, if, I, if I toss the coin 2,500 times, remember I, I did in the beginning of this long time ago when we began talking about probability, we talked about tossing a coin. Remember that? And I constructed tables and I, and I did simulation for 100 throws, I did simulation for, um, for 1,000 throws, for 10,000 throws, right? So what this is claiming is that you will see at least that type of convergence. You will see that 99% of the time when you perform this experiment, uh, the error 
between one half and what you're actually getting in the sample is going to be within one tenth. Okay, if you perform the, uh, this many trials. Does it make sense? So we're calculating the rate of convergence. For... We're calculating the rate of convergence, that's right. So this, okay. so you, you, in probability, this is the, what you always have to worry about. How fast is the answer obtained? How fast do we have convergence to the probability? How fast do we have convergence to the expected value, the average, right? When do you see, begin seeing it? Remember the St. Petersburg paradox, right? St. Petersburg paradox, the reason that you did not want to play this game once you realize it is because the convergence will be in, in, terribly slow. You will get um, infinite amount of money, but it will be many universe lifetimes, right? So not your lifetime, but uh, uh, unimaginably slowly con converging, right? So you will, not, uh, you will not have the opportunity of actually observing it. But when you toss a coin, you will have the opportunity to observe it because you see this is claiming as soon as you talk, as soon as you make a habit of playing this game at least 2500 times you will be seeing an error between from one half that is not more than uh, a tenth of a unit so you will be seeing numbers between 0 0.4 and 0 0.6 99% of the times when you perform the experiment sometimes you will see something else but 99% of the times that's what you will be seeing that's the weak law of large numbers is it clear? And uh, for the coins, you might have, because this is not specific to, uh, to binomial distributions. It's not specific to anything. Uh, it works for all random variables. So of course, uh, this n is just some gross estimate using this result, using the weak law of large numbers. Maybe a smaller n will work. Maybe if it's, a, it's an overkill for this problem, but you can be sure that if you perform it this many times, you will have that success rate. Good? Okay, are you ready for the strong law of large numbers? Would anybody like to paraphrase what's the weak law of large numbers and maybe speak out uh, or? Well, the law of large numbers is that if you have a bunch of data, then um, it will become a bell curve at some point. Well, the, that's the central limit theorem. What oh. you're thinking about the central limit theorem. So it's also an important thing, but Law of large numbers is that um, if you make a habit of something, um, then, uh, then the average is not, uh, not anymore due to chance. The average is very determined, okay? So there is a strong and a weak law of large numbers. So the weak law of large numbers just tells you that uh, you will rarely observe any deviation. So play a game many times. It's a, you, you, that's the thing that you should wonder. If you go and buy a lottery ticket, I cannot tell you, you see, it bothers me still. Is it a good idea to buy one lottery ticket or not? Right, uh, you see, it, because it, 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 the, theoretically speaking, you're just doing it once. Once, chance might be on your side, but if you if you make a habit of it, I can tell you for sure that you will be just losing, let's say, whatever, 99.9% uh, of your dollar, okay? It's basically, essentially, if you make a huge habit of, of playing lottery games, just buy billions of tickets, you will be just losing. Because your average gain will be like per game would be essentially like minus one dollar, or close to it. You understand? So that's that's how casinos win because uh, uh, the law of large numbers um, affects them. You might win in a casino or lose, but the casino always, always wins because uh, they just get essentially it's it's regulated what they're getting. Right? It's the same amount of money on average. Does it make sense? Insurance is everything else. It just that's the, that's the idea. Is that when you make a habit of something, then uh, the average is clearly seen, and that's what people forget, right? So, in in, in the people say in politics, for example, that every single person is unique, and perhaps that is very true. But there is such a thing as you say when you make statements. Let's say. Um, when you make um, statements about an average person, I imagine that the statement is not entirely meaning meaningless because you can take one parameter and on that one parameter, you can average out the qualities if it can be measured, right? And then you have uh, the typical, you can speak about the typical Russian in that sense. If you take the entire population of Russians and ask yourself, let's say, how aggressive is a typical Russian? And then you just, if you can measure aggression precisely, you would have an average. I can show you a video where I mentioned uh, about Russians. If you're interested at the end of the class, I'll show you Subway in Russia. Uh, made me laugh, but maybe it would make you laugh too if you have my sense of humor. Okay, don't forget, uh, I will show it to you, right? 
Good. Okay, so strong law of large numbers. Are you with me? Strong law of large numbers is saying the following. And that's going to be a bit difficult proof. Uh, we'll see if we can um, carry it through. Let x1, x2, and onwards be a sequence of independent and identically distributed random variables, each having the same average. Then we are claiming that uh, with, with probability one, that the limit as we go to infinity, uh, we will get the average. If, if I average the results, if I make my table infinitely long, uh, it is certainly with probability one, it will be getting to the volume u. So the limit exists. Before then, you see, now let me just try to explain to you what might be the difference between them. The difference between those results is this, right? So uh, is that this claiming that uh, to infinity, the actual theoretical limit will be approaching mu. That's the strong law of large numbers, what it's claiming, okay? The average is going to approach mu. And uh, weak law of large numbers is saying that uh, you will kind of um, see the convergence. It's a kind of like a delta epsilon proof, but it's imperfect because um, with probability, there is always a chance of witnessing something rare. You understand? So um, the weak law of large numbers, at least that's, that's one small take on it. Weak law of large numbers tells you that if you perform sufficiently many trials, you will very rarely witness aberrations. Very rarely you will, you will witness uh, violation. It's, it's like a delta epsilon, but that does not work all the time, but works most of the time, okay? The sequence, when the sequence converges, if it's a deterministic sequence, you can have a delta epsilon argument, or more so there is, a, there is a particular integer and starting from that integer, the difference between the sequence and its limit is less than epsilon. Yes, what uh, the weak law of large number is doing is trying to capture that idea for indeterminate sequences, for non-deterministic sequences. Whereas the strong law of large numbers is claiming that the limit will inevitably be mu. If you perform it uh, on and on and on, no matter how many aberrations you witness, inevitably in the long run, the limit is mu. You understand? They kind of express the same idea, but uh, maybe, emphasizing different aspects, okay? So, yeah, so that, 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 those, those are the laws that we took for granted in trying to understand probability. And this is just showing you that if you follow the axiomatic approach, uh, those laws will come out, right? Those laws will be consequences of the axiomatic approach. Are you following me, right? Okay, so here is uh, what we will, uh, I wonder if I should bother proving it. It's a bit uh, long. You let me know, guys. Do you want to see the proof or you want me to skip it and move on? And you can read it uh, later on. What would you prefer? Do it quickly before I start proving it. Quick, fast. You want me to narrate the proof or you want me to move along and you will look at it uh, onwards? Okay, Naomi says you can skip it. Uh, and what about the rest of you? You are you have fallen asleep, carbon monoxide poisoning from being too long in the house. Yes, the proof is very long. That's why I wonder if I should skip it. Although it bothers me when you say move on. You know, it, I think I can move on, but can you? All right, I'll move on. This is your proof. Uh, this is something that uh, I hope you will consider looking at. Uh, so here again, how. Uh, are the strong and weak law of large numbers different? The weak and the strong law of large numbers uh, speak about independently distributed random variables. They are both statements about the convergence, right? But um, as I mentioned, right, uh, did I have uh, examples here? H here is a, a simple example of a deterministic sequence. I'm just mentioning what I already talked about. Deterministic sequence, I just picked one over n as an example, right? Uh, so, you see, so uh, so this is sequence is uh, is going to uh, to uh, zero, and here is uh, another sequence B n, and B n is a sequence that does not go to zero. It's actually I'm, I'm showing you two deterministic sequences. B n is a sequence where you would see uh, one only at powers of two and zero elsewhere. 
So if you look at the column of Bn, eventually you're looking and all you're seeing is zero because uh, the distance between, uh, let's say, 2 to the 20th and 2 to the 21st is a big distance and, and the distance only increases between them, you see? So you're seeing essentially zeros with very few aberrations. So uh, if you study analysis, there is something known as weak convergence. That's where the language comes about, right? So in other words, um, it's a convergence that doesn't happen precisely. Just very rarely do you witness uh, the lack of convergence. It appears to you like convergence is happening, uh, but it's actually not a true convergence. Strong convergence, that's where the word strong and weak comes about. Strong convergence is, it means that if I look down the column here for AN, I look down the column, I eventually stop seeing the difference between zero and the numbers displayed. Yes, what uh, weak convergence means is that I look down the column for BN and I can notice the difference. It's just, it's gonna be very unusual. You understand? You might have to look through billion entrances uh, in the sequence to actually uh, find an aberration. The aberration becomes very rare. That's where the words strong and weak uh, are applied here, okay? So when you study analysis, you realize there are sequences um, that converge strongly and there are sequences that converge weakly, okay? And a weak, weak convergence it means, um, that it, it might still mean that the sequence doesn't converge. Like this example, you see the sequence does not converge to zero, but it weakly converges to zero. Whereas uh, one over N, the sequence is strongly converging to zero. Good? I hope it makes some sense. Okay, guys, so um, yes. Weak convergence means that uh, a lack of convergence is very rarely observed. Like with the toss of the coin, if I toss the coin uh, 2,500 times, I would very rarely, maybe well, not that rarely, one, one out of 100 times I witness uh, aberration. I witness average that is different, uh, that, is, that is more than one over 10 units away from one half, okay? So, uh, so weak convergence indicates that uh, you witness the aberrations less and less. Okay, moving on. Let me stop this video so that we can record the next one separately.